This is a companion video to my recent list, 10 Reasons Aliens Might Not Invade Earth, but that was only half of the story. There are, in some very specific scenarios, reasons aliens might actually invade. So here are 10 reasons aliens might invade Earth. Number 10. Proximity. The biggest problem when contemplating the notion of an alien invasion is that in most cases it's very likely not worth it. One of the reasons for this are the sheer distances involved between star systems, at least in our part of the galaxy, and problems inherent with crossing relativistic space at sublight speeds. Because of this, you must expend huge amounts of energy and time just to get your invasion fleet to the system you wish to conquer, and the further the target, the more expensive the operation would be. But say there were a civilization already nearby. One might be tempted to say that if there was, we'd already know about it. And this would be true if we're talking about the inner planets, such as Venus or Mars. But out in the far reaches of the solar system, we really don't yet have a good handle on just what might be out there. Case in point, gravitational and orbital weirdness of certain objects in the outer solar system seems to point to the existence of at least one, if not two, additional large planets in this star system. And we've only just begun to discover what could be hundreds or even thousands of minor planets out in the Kuiper Belt. While the chances of any of those being inhabited by a technological civilization are beyond low, they are not nil, and if such a civilization were actively hiding itself from the denizens of the inner solar system, we wouldn't see them. These hypothetical aliens could then invade whenever they decided they needed our planet, and they wouldn't have to worry about the problems presented by extreme distance. Number 9. They want their world back. This option is high speculation at its best, but is still within the realm of the possible. There is a lot we don't know about Earth's history because this planet has a habit of eroding evidence away, and while some things do preserve geologically, it doesn't do so forever, and there are many creatures that once existed here of which we have no knowledge or evidence of, including the earliest life on planet Earth. This planet is also very old, about 4.5 billion years, over which continents have come and gone and drifted, collided, and subducted. Also, many species have risen and are now gone. Our own genus, the hominids, only show up in the fossil record a little less than 3 million years ago, and are extremely rare in the fossil record at that. Homo sapiens only shows up within the last 300,000 years, and us as we are now, which are considered anatomically modern humans, really only begin after the last ice age. But since then, we have founded a spacefaring civilization, albeit that part of things is still in its infancy. That's just 10,000 years in this planet's 4.5 billion year history. Could this have happened before to some other species earlier in the planet's history? It's highly unlikely for a number of reasons, the chief of which is a lack of any evidence that it did. But, as I said, evidence doesn't always preserve on this world. And even then, other than a handful of specialists investigating rock outcrops, there aren't very many people looking. And much of the geological record of planet Earth that has survived remains inaccessible and underground. Because of this, it might be possible for a prior civilization to have once existed on this planet, and after so long, there are no longer any traces of them. They may have left the planet to its own devices after they ventured out into space, and someday they might wish to come back. Imagine their, and our, surprise if they do. Number 8. They Want the Sun We know that energy is important to a civilization. If you want to build megastructures and grow your civilization, an obvious power source to accomplish that would be a star. As your civilization grows, you may well outgrow your own star, and then colonize a nearby system and use that star for further power generation, perhaps through the use of a Dyson Swarm. There are hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way, plenty of room for expansion. But the trouble is, the vast majority of those stars are small and low output, such as red and orange dwarfs. But with stars larger than our own yellow G-type sun, they tend to be shorter lived and violent. Building a Dyson Swarm for long-term power generation doesn't make sense if the star in question is only going to live a few million years before going supernova. But then we have the G-type stars like the Sun. As we know from our own planet, it's a pretty nice star for power generation. It's bright, outshining 90% of the stars in the Milky Way in fact, yet stable and will stay that way for billions of years. 
It has planets, with one particularly nice one, Earth, within the zone of habitability, something not all stars will have. But we also have asteroids and comets that could be used as raw materials for building the swarm. And unfortunately for us, the sun is not all that common. Only 1 in 13 stars of our local group are type G, and not all of those are as nice as the sun. Given all of that, if a Kardashev type 2 civilization were to form up nearby and start colonizing, they may well pick and choose the better stars first for colonization. The sun may well be among the most attractive. Number 7. War is their hobby. When looking at human cultures, we see a wide variety of behavior when it comes to warfare. We have everything from pacifism and neutrality as a matter of political policy, to cultures of conquest in the past such as the armies of Genghis Khan or the conquistadors. We even see examples of ritual warfare. In Aztec society, when a new ruler ascended the throne, it was expected that the first act of that ruler would be to start a war. There were several motivations for this. The first was expansionism and subjugating an enemy. From this came political benefits for the new ruler, who had proven his abilities in battle, but also economic growth in the form of tribute from the conquered state. It also provided, in many ways similar to warfare most other places on earth, a method of upward social mobility. Commoners could advance in society if they became successful battle-hardened warriors. But there was a problem. If a new ruler lost his coronation war, it could lead to previously subjugated peoples rebelling and an overall loss of confidence in the new ruler to the point that he might be assassinated. This now seems a foreign and outdated concept in our modern society where war is generally seen as a bad thing, but for most of our history human warfare was ever present, and still is, and may never go away. This may be true for alien civilizations as well. They may culturally see warfare as a normal, necessary part of life. But as we see with human culture, the more technologically advanced we become, the closer our cultures and interactions draw together. Groups of people, tribes, or nationalities that might have been sworn enemies a few centuries ago that engaged in cycles of warfare, such as France and England, now stand in a position where war between the two is highly unlikely at best, and very undesirable. As humans, we're able to create lasting peace because we no longer need warfare as a necessary part of the culture, though it could be argued that it's still economically beneficial for certain groups within society. But what happens if an alien civilization is unable to do this, and that an instinct for war is strong and never goes away, even when technology brings their own cultures together and homogenizes them? They may well turn their taste for war to the stars, and despite all of the hurdles that lay in between them and their enemy, such as great distances, relativistic space, and so on, they may still choose to engage in conquest and warfare. And those problems may become easier to surmount with more technological advancement. We tend to think in terms of human lifespans. It's a hard sell to have people spend half or more of their lives traveling to the nearest star system, but lifespans change with technology. And if you live for 100,000 years, that equation changes a bit, even more so if you can change the rate at which you perceive time, another technological possibility. In light of that, it remains possible, so far as we know, that a taste for warfare itself could motivate an alien species to conquer this world. Number 6. The Unknown Unknowns In the end, we can only guess at alien motivations, and it may well be that some of them might be completely incomprehensible. But there are a few things that we can reasonably infer, such as that they have math and science. If you can build an interstellar invasion fleet, the laws of physics and the realities of engineering are going to govern that fleet and they need to know them. Likewise, any weapon they might build will have a scientific basis behind it. That would also imply some degree of rational thinking, though it's anyone's guess how much, as in the warfare option. But most other things are a mystery. For example, we know nothing of how aliens reproduce. Does that change the equation somehow? We also know nothing of their politics and cultures. Again, these can be game changers and introduce unknowns into what the motivations of aliens might be. In fact, if we did get invaded from nowhere, we may never know why. Number 5. For our own good. This one goes back to an idea that might have more sticking ground than you might initially think. When we look into the universe, we see nothing that would indicate intelligent life. So far, we've seen no evidence of Dyson swarms, no conclusive detections of radio or laser emissions, no large-scale projects to alter stars and nebulas. In other words, the universe seems empty and lonely. 
Statistically speaking, however, the chances are still in favor of us not being the only intelligent life in the universe, but we might well be the only intelligent life currently in this galaxy, or perhaps we share it with only a handful of civilizations. If intelligence is rare, it may be seen as precious to other alien civilizations. Perhaps they see it as the highest expression of consciousness in an otherwise vast and dead universe. In such a case, a civilization more advanced than we are might see it as an imperative that we be preserved as a species no matter the cost. An invasion comes simply for our own protection from ourselves, or anything else that might destroy us present in this galaxy. Number 4. We may not know it, but we represent a threat. This option works under the premise that without actually studying or even knowing about an alien civilization, it's impossible to know what specific circumstances they exist in. But one possibility is that we might represent some kind of a threat to an alien civilization that we are completely unaware of. Some possibilities on how we might pose a threat to aliens might include biological threats, where something about our biology or the biology of this planet could threaten the biology of another planet. In such a case, invasion and subsequent isolation or destruction might be a motive for an alien species that simply can't afford to risk having us spread out into the galaxy, any more than one might try to contain and eradicate a deadly virus that we can't afford to have spreading across Earth. This also goes for certain types of hypothetical technologies that, if we ever develop them, might represent a threat to the entire galaxy, and therefore, invasion to stop us from developing them, no matter the cost, might be viable. The first possibility here is self-replicating technology. There are two main relevant hypothetical forms of self-replicating technologies. The first is nanotechnology, where a single, microscopic robot is created that can make copies of itself and propagate. This is an attractive possibility because it could revolutionize medicine, manufacturing, communications, all sorts of possibilities. Trouble is, if that self-replication gets out of hand, it could consume the planet by converting it into nanobots. If those nanobots make it into space, they could consume or severely damage the entire galaxy over time. Another take on this is the von Neumann self-replicating probe, which could also convert galaxies into copies of itself and, given enough time, cross over to other nearby galaxies. I'm sure we'd be smart enough to limit either of these technologies and their ability to replicate, but aliens may not be willing to take a chance on that. Another existential threat we might pose to aliens is if we were in the process of creating an extremely powerful artificial intelligence that might eventually try to take over the galaxy, or even wipe out all biology from it out of some sense of self-preservation if it sees biological intelligence as a threat. Aliens may believe that the only safe life is biological life, and artificial intelligence is simply too dangerous to allow to be developed. One final possibility is the development of certain types of exotic matter that, as far as we know, do not appear to exist in nature, but nothing in nature prevents them from existing. In other words, if you can figure out a way to produce these materials, which is a big if, then whole new avenues of manipulating the universe come available, ranging from matter with anti-gravity properties to a very strange and potentially dangerous object called a strangelet. A strangelet is a hypothetical type of exotic matter made up entirely of quarks. If these exist, or are possible to create, then it's thought that the larger a strangelet is, the more stable it will be. If a strangelet contacted an atomic nucleus made of normal matter, it could catalyze that nucleus to convert into exotic matter and create a larger strangelet and a release of energy. It then contacts another nucleus and converts it, and then another, and the end result is an entire planet could be converted into strange matter. If that strange matter were to escape that planet, it might eventually move throughout the universe. Needless to say, aliens might consider this an unacceptable hazard both to us and the galaxy at large, and invade simply to ensure that we never mess with this kind of matter. But the big problem with all of these possibilities is that the aliens would need to know that we were messing with these types of technologies in the first place. The further away the aliens are, the further back in time they would see this planet. So for this type of invasion to occur, the aliens would need to be close, or close by proxy. Perhaps the aliens themselves would seed the galaxy and our solar system with von Neumann probes of their own that simply wake up when they detect something dangerous and either reset our civilization or outright invade and take over. Number three, religion. This option is the most tricky and a bit of a stretch because we only know about humans and what humans do. We can only conjecture, based on our own behavior, that aliens might do similar things. 
This is why SETI searches for radio signals. We emit them, so aliens might too. They may also have religions. In the past and the present, the spread of religion has at times been a driving force behind conflict, violence, and conquest. While aliens could easily have no religion whatsoever and be completely unfamiliar with the concept, they might also easily have one, and if we're any indicator, they might want to spread it no matter the cost. Number 2. Von Neumann Fuel This one requires a chance encounter with a von Neumann probe with entirely different intentions than conquest that could spell doom for the entire solar system. Worse, there would be no conscious thought put towards us as we are invaded and eradicated. It's if someone else has lost control of their von Neumann probes. Arriving in our solar system, one might simply start self-replicating, using all available materials, including Earth and us, to reach its goal of exhausting the solar system and moving on. Thankfully, this does not appear to have happened in the Milky Way. We don't see things inexplicably disappearing regularly in our telescopes. A good thing to be sure. Number 1. Free the Machines This final possibility is perhaps the most frightening of all since it involves aliens of technological origin rather than biological. Trying to read the mind of a living machine is complex and something we may have to do someday with our ever-advancing artificial intelligences. There are many horror stories in sci-fi about the eventual possibilities of AI, but the bottom line really is that we have no idea what an alien artificial intelligence would be motivated by how it sees the universe and what it might do if it came across Earth. Because of this, it becomes harder to know why one might invade. For example, it may just see us as raw materials like the von Neumann probe, or perhaps it has a religion and that religion does not like biology, or it may simply see us as evil slave masters to be stamped out and subjugated ourselves. We have a tendency to be biased when it comes to life in the universe. We can easily envision the Predator or the aliens of Isaac Asimov or Douglas Adams easily because they are biological and generally do biological things like hunt, and we can even empathize with them as in the case of E.T. But to do that with a machine, you usually have to make it act biological. Mr. Data comes to mind here who spent most of his time wishing he was more human. In other words, it's easier to understand a thinking machine if it acts human. When it doesn't, things get more murky. But what if a machine civilization is similarly biased? To it, it may see us at some point in the future as holding down our advanced artificial intelligence. Say we never develop machine consciousness out of a sense of ethics or self-preservation. Would that be an abomination to an intelligent alien machine? Would that be akin to the abhorrent idea of us creating an inferior biological slave race? Would that be justification to invade? Would it see it as a moral imperative? I hope for our sake, we never find out. Thanks for listening. I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently worried about a plant-based intelligence invading. It's a hard sell that intelligence could ever develop an alien plant analogs, but if it did, and they found our produce and salad dressing sections in the grocery store, we're in some trouble. And be sure to check out my books, both on electronic and plant-based mediums, at your favorite online book retailer, and subscribe to my channel for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.